Um, so this morning um, we have two um, presenters, vastly experienced presenters in the world of ADR. I don't think really either of them need um, any introduction to, to most of you. You'll all be very familiar with them, I'm sure. Um, they're going to take us through the procedures, the Engineers Ireland procedures for mediation, conciliation, expert termination, arbitration. Also talk a little bit about dispute boards and dispute avoidance, which are very hot topics at the minute. And also just to mention the pupillage procedure for those who are interested in um, maybe getting some further experience and exposure in the world of ADR. Um, so both uh, Kieran and Jerry will take us to an overview, I suppose, of the procedures. Also some recent updates, um, some of which happened, I suppose, just before or during the um, COVID. So it may, you may not be familiar with them or aware of them. And then also some, some planned initiatives. And so now I'm going to introduce our speakers. So Kieran Fahey will speak first. Kieran um, is a chartered engineer. He's a fellow of Engineers Ireland. He's an arbitrator, a conciliator, a mediator, an expert, um, and also an adjudicator. And um, he, Kieran is standing um, conciliator on a number of projects. Um, he's also a chartered arbitrator, a, f a former chair of the CIARB. Um, he's also on the ministerial panel for adjudicators, and he's um, a former chair of the Engineers Ireland Dispute Resolution Board. And I'll take the opportunity now just to mention as well, just to plug that Kieran will also be speaking tomorrow morning on a webinar online, so you can have a slightly later start tomorrow morning. Um, on the Society um, of Construction Law um, event, so it's, you'll get it through their website. It's, it, it's free to join in and it's on the, the topic of the standing conciliator, which we'll be touched upon today, so that might be of interest um, to some of you. Um, so thank you, Kieran. And um, then we also joined by Jerry Monaghan. So Jerry, also a chartered engineer, um, a fellow of the CIARB, and very recently a chartered arbitrator. Um, he's also a CEDAR accredited mediator, works as an arbitrator, adjudicator, conciliator, mediator, and is also on the ministerial panel of adjudicators and a former chair of the CIARB, and is also a current member of the Engineers Ireland DRB. So um, on that, I'll invite Kieran to start the presentation. Um, good morning, all. <coughs> um, um, thank you for the um, introduction, Denise. Um, can I say it's fantastic to be back here after all the COVID and that kind of thing. I think this is a great place to be, and um, it's great to be talking here again. Before I start, could I just say a few words about Hank Fogarty, um, who died very recently? Um, I think it's appropriate to say a few words about Hank here because he enjoyed an illustrious career as an engineer, and he contributed very significantly to this, in this institution. Um, as you probably know, and there's people in this audience, I'm looking at them here, some of you know, know him better and maybe longer than I did. Hank served um, for 38 years uh, in, in SIAC and towards the in latter years um, ran a very successful company as managing director. In fact, I think for many years the, the name, the words Hank and SIAC were absolutely synonymous. Um, <clears throat> what he, when I came on the... Um, Dispute Resolution Board of Engineers Ireland here. Hank had been here for many years and he remained on um, during my time as chair. He, I can say that he contributed greatly. He knew just about everybody in the industry um, and he brought a great balance to our discussions here and was sort of contributed very actively. You're going to be talking about the arbitration procedures in a short while here. I remember the drafting of those really came down to a group which comprised Hank, Tony Hossi, Siobhan Fahey and myself. And um, just over the years, as I say, he contributed greatly. Um, he was also, in fact, probably one of the things that occurred to me, as you probably know, Hank had a great love of the GAA. And in fact, um, there's a commemoration service for him on, at four o'clock on Saturday, the 18th of June, um, at Kilmacud um, Crooks GAA. And one of the things that struck me about um, Hank is that if you take in the sort of the pantheon of hurling, those who are in the pantheon, certainly in recent years, are simply known by their first names. You know, DJ, Henry, Joe. No more needs to be said. In the construction area, it struck me there were probably, or certainly, I know of two people who were referred to by their first name only. One of them was Max, and the other one was Hank. You didn't have to say anything else. Once you said that, people knew who you were talking about. Hank lectured on the course in Trinity, the excellent course. He, he lectured there for, I think, 20 years. Um, and um, can I just say at a personal level, a son of mine did the course a number of years ago, and he told me when I told him about Hank's death, he said he was the most popular lecturer by far. He had a sort of a common touch. He was full of tales of what actually happened in reality, 
um, um, and he knew what he was talking about. He also had a sense of um, of the longer view, and Hank, he said that Hank used to talk about law ella. No matter when you were involved in a dispute, Hank would have this perception or perspective of law ella. There was the longer view. And I think that says a great deal about the man and what he was. So I'd just like to say that and say that truly, the um, for Le Haderish. So. <clears throat> Jerry and I are going to talk to you this morning about the um, dispute resolution procedures about Engineers Ireland, and it's timely to go through this because there's quite a body of work there, and it goes back over many years. And what we're going to do is go through them, and I'm going to start, um, first of all, and give a bit of historical background, if you like. It's po possibly, you know, when you actually look at it, there's a lot of stuff, and it's there now available in electronic format only. And I've just set out there what they are. There's three arbitration procedures. There's two conciliation procedures. There's a mediation procedure. There's also an expert determination procedure. And there's a pupillage procedure. Pupillage procedure is not currently on the website, but it is available. And I, it will, Jerry, well, Jerry, and sorry, the other thing I should say is Jerry's going to talk about the three arbitration procedures. He's going to talk about the pupillage procedure. I'm going to talk about the other four. In other words, the two conciliation procedures, the mediation procedure, and the expert determination procedure. In addition to those, though, <clears throat> there are also on the website significant other accompanying documentation, which can be very helpful. And in particular, I suppose the most relevant is that in each case there is a model form of agreement for the particular type of appointment you're talking about. Let me talk about a bit very rapidly about the history of Engineers Ireland procedures. To the best of my knowledge, it goes back to 1987 when there was an arbitration procedure um, produced, and this was based on the corresponding ICE Institution of Civil Engineers um, document. document. Um, and in fact, one of the themes that's running through this is that practically all the way through, <clears throat> in recent years, we've diverged quite a bit, but certainly in the earlier years, there was close liaison between the documentation produced by Engineers Ireland and the corresponding documentation produced by the ICE. I mean, this was very apparent, say, for example, in the form of contract, the IEI form of contract was largely based on the corresponding ICE form. And of course, there was significant interconnection and um, cross fertilization between people from this institution and people from the IC at that time. So it wasn't just, if you like, all, way, all one way traffic. In 1994, <clears throat> the first conciliation procedure was produced. It was based on an ICE procedure, which came out first in 1988, and that was for minor works. And that subsequently was developed by the ICE. And, um, but the 1994 procedure was incorporated, or reference was incorporated into the IEI fourth edition. Um, then in 2000, there were two further, where there were two, the two existing procedures were revised and reissued as the conciliation procedure 2000 and the arbitration procedure 2000. Moving on in 2007, as you're probably aware, the PwC, the private work or the public works form of contract, was introduced, and that had a different form of conciliation. So in 2007, Engineers Ireland produced a a, a procedure, a conciliation procedure that was specifically drafted to be to be used in conjunction with the PwC. <coughs> Moving on in 2011, we had significant. Um, work done here, and there were four new procedures produced in that, that year. There was a mediation procedure which we'd never had before, we had an arbitration procedure because of the introduction of the 2010 Act, and then we had a sort of an expedited version, the 100-day arbitration procedure, and we also had a, a pupillage procedure introduced in 2011. 2013, the conciliation procedure 2007, in other words the one for use with the PwC, was revised and reissued. Um, in 2014, we got a, an expert determination procedure um, published, and then in 2020, the um, conciliation procedure 2013, in other words, the PwC version, um, was revised and reissued, and in 2021, the mediation procedure was looked at, um, and, and I'll go through what actually happened there. <coughs> If I start with the 2011 procedure, 2011 procedure, 
is, is uh, this document did draw to some extent. There was an ICE document at that time, which I think was construction mediation or something like this. This document drew on that, but it drew on a lot of other things as well. It's a very simply written document, and in fact one of its advantages is that it's readily accessible to somebody, to a party, you say, particularly a non-technical party that's not involved in mediation. The sections of the document are laid out there. They cover all of the things from the use of the procedure referral, the appointment of the mediator, then the, what the mediator has to be, independent, the conduct of the mediation. It's non-prescriptive. Essentially, it allows the mediator, in conjunction with the parties, to run the mediation in any way, and that the best way that it's felt appropriate. The significant requirement of the parties or the agreement of the parties to, to um, abide by confidentiality and to, uh, to work in a in, in without prejudice basis, then there are some miscellaneous procedures. As I say, document simply written in, a, um, in plain English to make it, uh, and in fact I should say that all of the procedures, certainly from 2011 on, are deliberately written in a plain English style and they're gender, gender neutral, specifically intended to be that way. This document has been used and it continues to be used by Irish Water in its form of contracts. In 2021, this procedure um, was revised and reissued, and the real reason for this was the, mediate, the introduction of the Mediation Act 2017, and it was felt that the document should be revised and made fully compliant with this. It contains the, it, it has the same structure, and in fact, there's only one fully new portion in a paragraph in it, and that's 4.3. And it says, you can read it there, prior to the um, mediation meeting, the mediator is to ensure the agreement, of the par sorry, the agreement to mediate is signed. That, that really goes back to the Mediation Act 2017. And also there is an obligation on the mediator to remind the parties that they're free at any time to get legal or technical advice. Also, the mediator's form of market form of agreement, I refer to the accompanying documentation, it is, that has also been updated. And again, that, has, that, that is a requirement within the Act to have a signed mediation agreement. And the market form of agreement is specifically um, written and, and presented in that fashion that it can be produced by the mediator and signed by the mediator and the parties and to, to comply with the requirements of the contract. Conciliation Procedure 2000, this is unchanged since September 2000. Um, it was, um, it's only available in electronic <coughs> format since 2011. Contains, you can see there, preamble, procedure 25 paragraphs, and a guide in 13 paragraphs. It's really a version of mediation with provision for a recommendation. The default status of that is that um, it becomes final and binding um, unless um, it, one of the parties or both of the parties within two weeks reject, rejects it. Um, it continues in general use. I mean, this is being fairly widely used today. Um, and one of the things to realise that this is a standalone document. You know, if you go to two parties or they say they're going to sign up to this to, to use this document, it is standalone, um, which is not the case for the conciliation procedure 2013. The conciliation procedure 2013 needs to be read in conjunction with the form of contract because it's specifically intended for this. What we've got, the revised version, um, is the, two, the original 2007 document, but updated. As I say, it requires the underlying contract, um, normally the PWC, but the private sector um, form of contract, the PSC, is also written in the same way, and this feeds into it. The original 2007 version contained a preamble, procedure 26 paragraphs, and a guide 11 paragraphs. This was simplified and produced in electronic form in 2013, um, a new preamble, the procedure was reduced to 19 paragraphs, and a new guide was written in 12 paragraphs. The original document had flow charts and various other diagrams and things like this, and um, the, the 2013 version was simplified. 2020 um, revision contains now two preambles. It contains the 2013 preamble um, simply to give the history of it and what actually happened, and it contains a new 2020 preamble. The procedure largely the same, except it has been expanded to 19 par uh, 24 paragraphs from 19, and the guide is essentially the same, except it contains two new paragraphs to take account of the changes, which I'm going to talk to you about now. 
There are five new paragraphs in the 2020 revision. There's 1.15 to 1.18 inclusive and 1.22. If I jump down to the bottom, 1.22 simply says this is not conciliation under the 2017 Act, just in case there should be any misunderstanding of that and it should be construed as that. If I go back up 115 to 117, those paragraphs allow the conciliator to do a number of things within, 20, with, sorry, within 14 days after the recommendation has been issued. And they are to correct an error or mistake. It's, in other words, it's the slip rule that you get um, very frequently in arbitration. It's the same thing. If somebody has made a minor typographical error, that can be corrected within a period of 14 days. Equally, if something has been omitted, if a claim has been omitted from the recommendation by the conciliator, that can be dealt with, again, within 14 days, or clarification can be provided. Paragraph 1.18 deals, uh, says that the time for consideration of the recommendation is to be set by the conciliator unless, agree, unless stipulated in the contract or agreed by the parties. So it isn't within in the 2000 um, 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 procedure, there's a period of 14 days set. That's not the case here. And so it needs to be set elsewhere, in other words, in the contract or by the parties by agreement. And it also, this says that the consequences of a notice of dissatisfaction is set out in the contract or agreed by the parties. That again is different to the 2000 procedure and that's why this is not a standalone document. The parties have to, in their contract, set out what the consequences of a notice of dissatisfaction are, or else they have to agree what it is. Um, expert determination procedure, this is an entirely new procedure in 2014. Um, um, this has a preamble together with 27 paragraphs in whatever it is, five sections. The preamble is worth reading because it sets out the approach to be adopted, what, what the thing is the document is trying to achieve. But the general purpose is to provide an alternative to arbitration when a final and binding um, um, decision is, is, is sought. It's different from arbitration and it's, and it's normally, normally but not always, it's normally pitched at a relatively sort of precise issue, in other words, is something, has something been achieved? Has a standard been achieved? Has a milestone, has a target been achieved? And it's normally, the, the, the task is normally carried out by, by, it's carried out by the expert, often chosen on the basis of expertise in the, in the specific field. The expert is subject, the expert has much greater freedom than an arbitrator, and you know, this is set out in the procedure. Um, can use his, her own expertise, can make inquiries, can meet the parties separately, all of that. Not possible, certainly not, a lot of that is not possible in arbitration. And the other final thing in relation to that, the parties are to pay their own costs and share the costs of the expert um, equally. Um, if you're interested in expert determination, there's a very good book. It's also called Expert Determination by, um, it was originally by a guy called John Kendall, and it's been, there's a, I think the fifth edition is now available, um, produced by a guy called Clive Friedman. So that's it, that's, what it, that's the overall picture of the, um, the procedures and covering sort of four of them in somewhat greater detail. So thank you very much. Good morning all, uh, thank you Kieran, and thank you Denise for the, for the introduction. I might begin as well by just mentioning Hank, Hank Fogarty. I didn't, I didn't know Hank quite as well as, as Kieran or as some other of you in the audience, but I had various dealings and interactions with him over the years. Hank was a very engaging, likeable, knowledgeable chap. Um, I always felt when you, when you left a discussion with him or an interaction with him, you felt the better for it, whether you agreed with him or not, you, you gained from it. Um, he was hugely knowledgeable in the construction industry. Uh, you know, he came from a contractor's background. But he, he was entirely, I found, non-partisan in, in his views. He understood the challenges that contractors faced, but equally he understood and could talk uh, comprehensively about the challenges that employers faced in terms of funding, due diligence, uh, difficulties getting projects across the line, and also engineers and, and employers' representatives. Uh, and I know that I, I spoke at length with them over the years about the, you know, the race to the bottom in terms of design fees and the negative impact that had on the quality of the designs, the drawings, 
the works requirements, which in turn led to further further disputes. Uh, so he, he really understood it, and he's, he's a very strong supporter when the ACI and other professional bodies um, w were seeking to have the, the quality cost criteria for procurement of consultants changed, and I, I always remember his, his support in that regard. Back in 2017, in this, in this very lecture hall, I, I was involved in organising a conference on dispute avoidance in construction. Billy Morrissey, who I see at the back here, was, was involved as well. It was a joint effort between the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and Engineers Ireland. Hank, Hank spoke on the topic of standing conciliation. We, we had dispute board members, international, internationally recognised names, and domestic standing conciliators speaking really on the topic of dispute avoidance. Hank spoke very eloquently and comprehensively on it. He was passionate about dispute avoidance. He knew the benefits of it. He knew the benefits of collaboration. Projects need to be built, and he, you know, he, he understood the, the kind of the, what could be achieved by a good standing conciliator working, working well. Um, and he contributed enormously to that day. At the, at the speaker's dinner later on that evening in the, um, the hotel behind us here, the, uh, the Herbert Park, you know, Hank, Hank was there as well, and he, the, the, the discussion continued with, with the speakers. I also remember at that dinner, over a few glasses of wine, he was telling us about his, his holiday home in, in the south of France. He bought a, a property in, in Valbonne in the historic core of, of the old town, which is hundreds of years old. And he was telling us about the difficulties he had. It was a protected structure, so you, you, you know you couldn't paint a piece of skirting board or move a, a light switch without getting permission. Uh, so he, he's keeping us in, informed about the challenges there. But he enjoyed it, and, and sadly, I, I think he. But I understand he passed away at his property uh, in in France. So look, that's all I want to say. He was, he was a good guy, and may he may he rest in peace uh, on that. So look, what I want to do very, very briefly is, is Kieran has, has set out the, the history of the procedures at, at, at on the Engineers Ireland DRB uh, procedures. I want to start by going into some more detail on the arbitration procedure 2011. I suppose the, the, the backdrop to the, the arbitration procedure 2011, the driver really is, is, is the Arbitration Act. But I internationally at the time, you know, in the first decade of this century, arbitration was getting something of a bad rap. Time and costs were often at large on inter large international arbitrations. They were open ended. Um, huge, huge costs, you know, are, are arising from arbitration. And the institutional bodies in the LCA in London, the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce in, in, in Paris, you know, undertook various studies and investigations into what what, what is the driver of these uh, excessive time and cost metrics, really. And in, in 2007, the ICC Commission on Arbitration produced a report, you know, identifying the, the primary drivers. And you know, one of them was that arbitrators, international arbitrators, are you know, w were taking on appointments when their calendar didn't really allow them to take it on properly. They, they were booked up for six months or a year. Another finding was that the um, 82, 83 percent of the cost of international arbitration were expert fees, legal fees. So there's huge amounts of back and forth documentation, uh, statements of claim, back and forth, really long uh, open-ended hearings, and it really the, the, the process wasn't controlled. And, and what the ICC did, it, they produced new arbitration rules in 2012 on the back of the, their, their studies, which really set up, mandated a process to, make, to enforce the arbitrator and the parties to design a tailor-made process towards arbitration with a view to, to controlling time and costs. In terms of at the preliminary meeting, in terms of the number of rounds of documentation, dealing with the experts together, the length of the hearing, uh, and, and really put a put a put a, a framework on it to reduce the time and costs of it. Engineers Ireland, to their credit, and uh, and O'Kearn was 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 uh, chairman at the time. And he, he mentioned earlier that Hank Hank Fogarty was involved with the with the putting together the procedures. In, in many ways, they, they were they were ahead of the curve. They're ahead of their time. They were quite pioneering because not alone did they reflect the, the Arbitration Act 2010. To do in and of themselves put a structure, perhaps not as, 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 as clearly defined as the ICC, but to do put a framework or a structure on how an arbitration should properly be run and how, how best an arbitrator and the parties can control time and cost uh, on it. So that's a bit about the background. The, the <coughs> prepared, as I said, for, for use with the Arbitration Act 2010, Kieran mentioned the 87 and uh, 2000 procedures, and they were intended for use with the earlier arbitration acts in Ireland from 1954 to 1998, 
and these in turn will base generally on the, the ICE arbitration procedure. The Arbitration Act 2010 came in, in in Ireland, I think, in June 2010, and that was based on the UNCTRAL model law. The UNCTRAL model law is effectively a, a template for international arbitration, which, which dictates and sets out how an arbitrator and the parties should deal with the arbitration from, from commencement to issue of the final award. Um, the 2011 procedure, then the Engineers' Arbitration Procedure, has used the UNCTRAL arbitration rules 2010, as you might expect, as a base and remains cognizant of the ICC uh, procedure themselves. The Arbitration Act 2010 significantly has significantly expanded the arbitrator's authority. Uh, the procedure reflects the increased authority and exploits opportunities within the Act to streamline the process. So in terms of multi-party arbitrations or, or joined or, or timelines or dealing with experts, support of the courts and otherwise, the, the, the procedure reflects the increased authority there. It allows multi-party arbitrations and tribunals with more than one arbitrator. And generally, it's used in more complex disputes, large and more complex disputes. It's very, very well written. It's, it's clear and easy to understand, uh, and it, it's a very, very good procedure to my mind. The the hundred day arbitration procedure then was also published in, in, in 2011. This 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 procedure aims to facilitate facilitate rapid determination of disputes and to provide an interim award in all matters other than costs within 100 days of appointment. So broadly three months from, from appointment. So it's, it's a very, very useful and clear procedure in and of itself. I, I, I think it's, I, I understand anecdotally that it's an increase in use in, in Ireland. Um, you know, it's, it, the award is, is, is binding and final. Ar Article 30, 34, I think it is, at the model law, there's very little recourse to overturning award. So there are certain advantages to it, to arbitration. Uh, and it, it can be done within, within, within 100 days. It has to be read in conjunction with the, with the, with the main procedure, the Engineers Ar Ar Ireland Arbitration Procedure 2011, but if there's any conflict or discrepancy, the 100-day procedure in and of itself prevails. So when does it apply? It applies obviously where your dispute resolution clause dictates that it applies, or and or where the parties have so agreed. It's intended for, for disputes with the sole arbitrator and two parties, so it's not a multi-party dispute or there isn't an arbitral tribunal, a three-person tribunal, it's one arbitrator, two parties. Cases with claims and counterclaims for, for the, immune, the amounts are not particularly large and issues are straightforward. Um, the ICC have, have in Paris have the expedited arbitration procedures. They set a limit of about €2 million Euro as the, at the value of the dispute as, as the cap on, on the expedited procedures. There's, there's no, no cap here, but the, 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 the preamble uh, of the procedures do say that it's, it's for relatively straightforward disputes and for the, for the issues, uh, for the amounts are not particularly large. That said, I, I, know, I, I know from speaking to various parties that they have been used for medium, medium sized disputes of the order of 5 million uh, euro have been used successfully. The arbitrator must confirm that he or she can devote the time necessary to deal with the issues. The appointment is made as per the Engineers Ireland 2011 arbitration procedure documentation. Timetable then is of the essence, very, very important. The 100 days cannot be extended by the arbitrator unless the parties agree. Within 100 days, the arbitrator can set and modify a timeline for steps within the process. Uh, and there's a suggested timeline set out, appended to the procedure themselves, which is very, very useful. But the arbitrator can't, can't tweak it to, to an extent. Essentially, that the, the, you know, the, the core, the core principle or, or initial uh, steps is that the, the statement of claim, statement of counterclaim are generally submitted together and within 28 days of, of appointment of the arbitrator themselves. So what does the arbitrator have to do? The arbitrator has to determine all matters other than costs within 100 days in, his, in the interim award. The arbitrator is entitled to withhold delivery of the interim award until fees are paid. Importantly, if the interim award is not made within 100 days, either party may terminate the arbitration. And if the arbitration is terminated in this fashion, his fees, uh, he, has no, he or she has no entitlement to the fees. So that's a very important point, that the, the timeline is critical. Uh, otherwise, either party can, can terminate the process. Uh, you know, frankly speaking, speaking personally, I, th I think the, the issue around fees is probably secondary to kind of maybe reputation, reputational issues you might have as an arbitrator, if you take it on the 100-day procedure, like adjudication or otherwise, you know, you're, you're absolutely 
required to deal with it within 100 days, uh, quite simply. Once the interim award is given, either party can request the arbitrator to deal with costs, and costs are dealt with in the final award, and parties have the opportunity to make submissions on costs. One of the issues the, the Engineers Ireland Dispute Resolution Board are, are, are due to consider in, in the coming period is something of an anomaly whereby you get an interim award within 100 days, yet it's, it's, it's open-ended in terms of the final award dealing with costs. So arguably it could take six months or a year. I'm not sure how long it would take. So that's considered a bit of an anomaly, and we're going to look at, at addressing that to, to amend the procedure, I think, or put an addendum to the procedure to really put a timeline and a structure on, on the dealing of a cost issue. I think it, it requires that and it warrants that. So watch this space for that. Um, where do I want to go next? Dispute boards and dispute avoidance. And there's some useful uh, text and, and narrative on the Engineers Ireland Dispute Resolution Board website about dispute boards. Dispute boards are, are, are increasingly common in international and domestic projects. They're generally used it's a dispute board is a generic term used to include dispute adjudication boards and dispute review boards. Uh, dispute review boards tend to be used more in the, in the US. Generally, they're three person boards and they're appointed to the management <coughs> of large projects. The, I suppose the essence behind it is that the dispute board, where it's a singular three person board, becomes familiar with the, with the, with the, with the project, the technical uh, difficulties, the technical challenges of the project, the program, the cost the ground conditions, whatever, the issues on site. He or she also becomes familiar with the, with the parties themselves, their, their needs, their, their, their challenges, their idiosyncrasies, so that when, when issues arise, the dispute board member, be it one, a single person or three person, or, or can hit the ground running, so to speak, in terms of helping parties deal with the dispute. Um, and that's, that's a key advantage. Uh, the, the dispute board can provide informal assistance, and, and, and Philly will come out at the moment, in fact, mandates this under Clause 21 3 of the new pr procedures. Informal assistance by way of non binding recommendation upon invitation of the parties as to how an issue could be dealt with or how a dispute could be avoided. The also, if, if, if the dispute arises then or crystallises, uh, it, it's generally referred to the dispute board and they produce a, a binding decision. Uh, and that decision becomes final unless it's formally rejected in favour of arbitration or otherwise. The FIDIC 2017 contracts, as I mentioned, uh, have actually changed the name of the dispute board. It used to be the DAB, the Dispute Adjudication Board. It's now called the DAAB, so it's the Dispute Avoidance and Adjudication Board. And there's, there's a separate clause, subclause 21.3, on dispute avoidance itself. Dispute avoidance is, is, is very much in vogue uh, internationally and in Ireland. Um, the standing conciliation procedure out of the public works contracts that I, I know Kieran will, is going to, and Denise will be. Uh, speaking on the topic tomorrow on an SEL event. You know, it, it, in and of itself, it is a, it's a form of a dispute board. It's a hybrid form, perhaps, in, in, to my mind. Um, and, and again, if you read the guidance notes for, 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 for under the public works contracts for the project board and standing conciliation, the avoidance of disputes is, is a key part of the role of a, of a standing conciliator. The procedures, I think, are currently under review and they could be improved, arguably, but without doubt, the avoidance of disputes and, and making sure the projects continue is, is, is a very a key part of the function of a standing conciliator. Um, and you know, you, you can see it with FIDI, the multilateral development banks, uh, the World Bank and such like for internationally funded projects have, have required or specified that all projects with I think above a capital value of, of 15 million must have a dispute board in, a, uh, in place from contract signing. So the use of dispute boards is going to become more common. The NEC4 uh, new engineering contract for also makes provisions for them. <coughs> and with the project Ireland 2040 expenditure that we expect in Ireland, I think there'll be some very significant projects, and I think the use of standing conciliation or dispute boards will, will, will increase. And the Engineers Ireland Dispute Resolution Board are and will remain active in this area in terms of training and development uh, and advocating on behalf of dispute board members and standing conciliators. So, again, that's, it, that's an initi initiative that we're, we're going to take on. Just a bit about, uh, this, is, this is a slide I've taken from the Dispute Resolution the Board Foundation, uh, published at a, at a recent conference. You know, are, are dispute boards effective was, was the question they were asked. And they presented some data from 2018. Um, and from the reported 512 decisions, so in other words, when, when a dispute arises on the dispute board, it's actually sent for a formal binding recommendation to the dispute board itself. Of the 512 decisions, 
issued. Only 32 of those were referred to arbitration and subsequently only seven uh, of the referrals to arbitration was the original decision of the dispute board overturned. Which means that most of the, the dispute board decisions were accepted by the parties or were subsequently used to sort out the differences amicably. The dispute board process therefore has a success rate of about 94% 94% in avoiding expensive follow-on dispute resolution processes or procedures. Plus the fact the DRBF is saying that 78% of all decisions referred to arbitration were eventually upheld confirms, confirms that the method is as good as the more established methodologies. So look, th th that's the data, uh, the DRBF or, or, or the, 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 the guys that, that collate this data and they're pointing to fairly significantly uh, important and clear metrics in terms of the success of, of dispute boards. So it's, it's, it's there, there in black and white. Um, Kieran mentioned in his in his introduction and when he was going through the, the list of procedures that we have, he, he mentioned the Engineers Ireland pupillage procedure. This procedure was produced originally again in in in, in uh, I think it was May 2011. There's a lot of procedures produced in May in 2011. You were obviously had your wheelbooks that year. Uh, the board, um, the, the procedure as you can see there, it's it's published in May 20, 2011. The purpose is to facilitate the growth of expertise in dispute resolution through mentoring. Uh, essentially, it's a chicken and egg kind of scenario again. It, for, 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 for persons that have experience of, of engineering, contract law, quantum, or otherwise, or a mixture of all three, that want to, you know, could contribute towards being a dispute resolution practitioner. How do you get your first appointment? How do you get in there? How, how do you get started? So this, this, this procedure aimed to facilitate the growth of expertise in that area. And how, how did it do it? It aims to put suitable candidates in touch with working practitioners, very simply. So it's, I won't quite say it's like speed dating or otherwise, but uh, you know, there's a list, Engineers Ireland will maintain a list of, of persons willing and capable of acting as pupils, which is important. You know, you must have some training and a background in the area. And a list of the existing arbitration and conciliation panel members who are willing to act as mentors. It's effectively a mentoring process. The, the lists are established and provided to both part, both Members of both the lists will be aware of the, the respective other lists. And the onus then is on the pupil to try and make the arrangement with the mentor uh, to gain that kind of level of experience. Very importantly, prior agreement of the parties. So any, any dispute, you obviously you, you can't bring a pupil along with you until you get prior and explicit agreement of the parties to do so. And obviously, um, the arrangement is, is entirely confidential. Uh, and that's, that's, that, that's of, of key importance. Usually, there's the, the, the procedures themselves, there's a formal process set out within the documents of review at the end of the, of the pupillage procedure at a particular dispute for consideration of lessons learned and, and, and feedback between the pupil and, and, and the mentor, which is very useful. So it's a kind of structured feedback process in and of itself. Uh, currently, the, the procedures are not on the Engineers Ireland website, uh, if we keep me right on this, uh, but there, there have been a number of kind of very minor tweaks to make them more user friendly uh, and, and those tweaks have, have been largely accepted and the, the procedures due to go to the board later this month I think on Friday is it this, this, this week uh, and we, we expect that the, the procedures will be relaunched will, will be accepted will be approved and, and relaunched thereafter so so again watch this space so so, so that, that, that's more or less it for me I think what we've Kieran and myself have, have, have aimed to do is give a very brief overview of the existing procedures, uh, w recent amendments in terms of the mediation and conciliation procedures, and, and what what we can expect uh, to happen in, in, in the coming weeks and months. So with that, thank you very, thank you very much.